So I went for a run this morning, and there were about 10 times more people running on the road today <laughs> than I normally see, and they're all looking very smart in their bright, shiny running clothes and new running shoes and all these sorts of things. And um, uh, it's, it's an easy one to go for when you're preaching uh, the first message of the year, but let me just give you a warning. The last time I preached the first message of the year in this church, it was January 2020, and what a great year we had. <laughs> So I'm not saying that whole thing was me, <laughs> but uh, yeah, it's uh, a better year this year. Um, so anyway, um, let me start with the story. I normally have a rule when I'm preaching, only one big word and only one big story. And um, I might have more than a, a few stories, but I'll have no big words tonight. But I have one, one good story. So a couple of years ago, um, I'm from a fairly, fairly large family. We were 23 immediate family members together this year. Um, and so about five or eight years ago, my older brother, he's about five years older than me, we get together on Christmas and everyone notices my brother, who's normally quite thin and lean, has, has grown just the smallest of little late 30 paunches, you know, the little, the little prosperity down here below. And so as we ha- do, we all had a couple of comments, you know, um, Joking, joking, and we left it at that, and, and we went on our way, and we got together again in Easter, and it was gone. He had lost the weight. It was sort of like three or four months, the weight's gone. So we were all sort of, you know, getting around to it, and eventually we're like, Tim, what, you know, what was it? What was the, what's the secret sauce here? How do you just lose weight so quickly? What, what do you do? And we were all expecting like, you know, seven hours of CrossFit before breakfast, before breakfast, two pounds of bacon, and then intermittent fast the next day. We're all expecting something along those lines, and, and his answer was like, I just ate a little bit less. <laughs> like, okay, fair enough. And I've come to realize on the back of that that if you want to lose weight, um, you've got to do these three things. And so this is everyone's New Year's resolution, whether you have one or not. I'm the type of person, I don't really have a list, but you go into the year with some ambitions. And if this is what you want to do, everything that works involves these three things. Eat a little bit less, eat a little bit better, a little bit better, and do a little bit of exercise. It's sort of... So there's a whole bunch of people going to come to me afterwards about intermittent fasting and banting and plate, and, and you're all going to be angry, but, but it's going to involve at least one of those three. And the reason we don't succeed is not because we don't know it involves those three. And it doesn't mean you eat 10% of what you used to eat, one lettuce for breakfast and exercise 10 hours a day. It's just a little bit of those consistently over time and you'll be a healthier person and we all know that. The reason we don't do it is we don't like those three. It's not nice eating less. The second portion is always the portion of the good stuff. Um, That little snack at 9.30 at night, that's not like rye bread you're eating. You're eating chocolate, bro. (laughs) Me too. and it's just easier not to exercise. So, so that's kind of where we end up. And so um, here's a question. How do you think about going into your new year? How do you approach it? I sort of mentioned now, I'm not really a one for like lists. These are the 10 things I want to get done this year. But invariably sometime over this quieter period where you're either with family or, or work's a bit quieter, you sort of sit and you reflect on the year and you think about the year ahead. And no one thinks, sits and thinks, man, I hope the next year is worse. I hope I'm more terrible than I was this last year. No one is aiming for less. Everyone goes into the year. It's almost like there's this opportunity, whether you have a list or not, you, 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 you want to have some sort of goal. And I've, I've gone after the, the, the physical goal because it just seems like, in many ways, it's the least threatening. Because if we had to go through some of the other goals... I want to restore the relationship with a family member. I want to um, find healing in an area. I want to wrong, um, correct one of the wrongs of my past. I want to, you start to go into those and it gets a little bit quiet in the room. So we'll, we'll talk about exercise instead. Um, but 1 Timothy 4 verse 8 says this, For physical training is of some value, but godliness has value in all things holding promise for both the present life and the life to come. And so how do you think about godliness in the year to come? 
How are you approaching it? What are you thinking? And, and that's really the, the preach I want to preach tonight. I need to go get something. Don't deafen me. I'm talking about food. That's a beautiful ciabatta and a good bottle of wine. Um, I won't say great bottle because someone will come and tell me that they've got a better one. Um, so Jesus, on the night before he went to the cross, he meets with his disciples, and he could have picked anything in the world to do. He could have washed their feet again. He could have gone, guys, let's go through the Sermon on the Mount again. Come on, we need to remember this one properly. He could have done anything. And he has a meal with them, and in Matthew 26, it's a version I've chosen to put up here, 26 verse 26. Now when they were eating together, Jesus took bread, and after, give, after blessing it, broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, take, eat, this is my body. And he took a cup of wine, uh, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them saying, drink it, all of you. And so he could have picked anything to do that night, and he picked these two. He picked two symbols, bread and wine, and he picked this as to be the, the thing that he's going to leave his disciples with. And now this, can, this last supper means many things, but I want to pick on those two symbols, the bread and the wine. And I want to run through it. So in the Bible, these symbols, he could have picked olive oil. He could have picked anointing oil. He could have picked anything, any symbol that comes from the Old Testament. He could have put a lamp on the table and spoken about that. But he picked these two. And these symbols are used for a specific reason. So bread in the Bible typically talks about, um, there are a couple of meanings for it. One is it's a gift of God, so the manna from heaven. God gives his gift to his, 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 his people. And it talks about our need for substance, substance, and our hunger reminds us of our need for God. It's a symbol of God's word for us. So that line, God will not live, uh, man will not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. So the bread of God is literally his word, his spoken word to us. Secondly, it's a symbol of fellowship. So in Genesis 18, Abraham serves bread to the three, the three guests, um, his, um, the, three, the three visitors, and he also serves bread to Melchizedek in uh, Genesis 14. It's a symbol of friendship. So when someone um, comes to your house in the, Jewish, in the Jewish tradition, you would break bread with them. It was a, a sign of friendship. And lastly, um, in the Bible, when you're looking at offerings in the Old Testament, it's a symbol of God's covenant relationship with us, so his fellowship with us. So uh, the grain offerings and the bread offerings on the altar in the Old Testament are part of the covenant symbols of his friendship to us, his relationship with us. And so that's the picture of bread, and that's the picture Jesus went with. He says, here's the bread. It's my, it's my recognition of your need recognition of your dependence, of your hunger, of the things that you need. It is a picture of our relationship together, our friendship, our fellowship. It's a picture of those, and it's also a picture of God's friendship for us. And then wine as a symbol in the Bible. There are many different symbols. There's some negative symbols around drunkenness, but in a positively speaking way, because I'm guessing Jesus is going for a positive symbol, um, Free wine is a picture of God's divine grace. So when you come across wine that's been given away, it's a picture of his divine grace. And in Song of Solomon's, it is uh, the metaphor used for intimate love. Fresh wine or, or, or good wine is, is, is like marriage love. Um, and so that's the other symbol he goes for. He got, um, actually, that there is a, uh, an intimacy here that actually there's something special about this. There's something of um, God's divine grace over your life. And so this is the meal that he leaves his disciples with. And, and how often would uh, a Jewish man eat bread? Every day. And wine was not the 12% that we, we, we typically drink. It was, um, it was something that they would drink fairly regularly. And so this is the picture of what he has for us. And so it's a beautiful picture it's like actually every time you, you eat and you drink, remember actually God's provision, God's friendship, God's covenant, his friendship covenant, his divine grace, his love, his enjoyment over you. And that's the picture we have. Um, 
And that's a beautiful picture. But Jesus had done more than just pick these two symbols. These disciples had been with him for three years. They had seen many miracles. And there are two particular miracles that stand out that involve bread and wine. So I want to run through those quickly because sometimes we think in the year ahead, our aim from a godly perspective is actually just have good friendship with God. We bring good wine. We bring, we bring all of this to, the, to his table. We sit, we eat, we enjoy him. We enjoy his provision, all of these things. And that's, that's sort of half of the picture. So I want to jump to, to, to Mark, verse, uh, Mark chapter 8 for the first of the, the second part of the picture. So we've gone through the imagery from the sort of Old Testament, and now we go on a bigger picture from the New Testament, um, some of the miracles that, that Jesus performed. And so the first one with the bread, Jesus hadn't just picked the image of bread coming all the way from Abraham, he had performed a miracle with bread a few times. He had fed 5,000 people with five loaves, and he had, I think it was five, but I'm going to read the version where he feeds 4,000 people with seven loaves. So, so Mark chapter 8. In those days, um, when again a great crowd had gathered, they had nothing to eat, and he called his disciples to him and said to them, I have compassion on the crowd because they have been with me now for three days. We'll come back to the three days. And have nothing to eat. And if I send them away hungry to their homes, they will faint on the way. And some of them have come from far away. And his disciples answered him. And I love to read the questions the disciples ask because I've started to realize those are the questions I ask in different forms. But I ask these questions, so I don't laugh too hard at their questions. I, I'm, I'm starting to read them very carefully. And his disciples answered him, how can we feed these people with bread here in this desolate place? And I, you know, the beginning of the year for you might mean school fees to be paid. <laughs> how can we feed all these people in this desolate place? So his disciple is like, well, just feed the 4,000 people. Where? Out of what? This is a desolate place. And I've asked, sometimes asked that question in many, in many different formats. How do I feed in this desolate place? And he asked them, how many loaves do you have? So sometimes when we, we're wondering, uh, how do we get this right in a desolate place? God answers, what do you have? How many loaves do you have? They said seven, and he directed the crowd to sit down, and he took the seven loaves, and having given thanks, he broke them and gave them to the disciples to set before the people. And, he, uh, and they set them before the crowd. Um, there was, jump to verse eight. Uh, they ate and they were satisfied, and the broken pieces left over filled seven baskets. And there were 4,000 people, and he sent them away. So let's just jump into some of the, the imagery we have there. Um, Quick story. There was a time in my life I ran out of money. I wasn't poor. I just ran out of money. Um, and I found this trick. Um, if I had to give you an old piece of bread and say, just eat, just eat it, it's quite tough to eat. But if I had to bake this in an oven now, you could probably eat it just like this. You'll take a chunk, and it's delicious. And so what I would do is I figured out what time the local pick and pay, back when they used to bake the bread there, they put it out, and I'd go grab a loaf of brown bread in a packet, and you can eat it, the whole thing. Just like that. It's delicious. You might get indigestion, but it's delicious. Um, and so fresh bread is something It's incredibly satisfying. But if you read the story carefully, they had been three days before away from when anyone had found any fresh food. And um, the bread you buy these days has things in it that means it'll stay fresh for a good couple of weeks if it's um, a certain type of bread, months. It's scary how long it takes to grow mold. Um, but if you've ever baked bread or you've maybe been to Mozambique, you get that power. You buy it in the morning. By the afternoon, it is hard. Next day, scoop it out, make a helmet. It is rock hard. You cannot. One day old bread is like rock hard. Three day old bread. I was reading this and I, like, I read it again. I think, and Jesus broke it. I think he shattered it. He was like, bah, broken bread. So they had seven three day old Loaves of bread. Stale bread, hey? Really stale bread. It doesn't tell us whether the bread the people ate was stale or fresh. But in my mind, the God that works miracles doesn't provide stale bread. 
So they provide him with seven stale loaves. And he gives 4,000 people fresh bread. And so the picture we have is not really that picture. Sometimes our meal with Jesus, this is what we bring. It's one slice and two crusts. I don't, don't look closely for mold. And so that's actually the picture of the New Testament. The picture the disciples had of bread in their head. That actually Jesus can take this old bread and he can feed multiple people. Thousands of people with fresh bread. So that's the first picture the disciples had in their head. The second one, we get to the wine. Um, so John chapter 2 verse 6, what had happened is this Jesus now, it's the beginning of his ministry. He has performed no miracles, nothing. He's got a few disciples um, and he goes to a wedding. It's clearly someone like a family friend or someone he knows and the wine runs out. And the context in those days is that at a wedding, your family would provide you with these big vats of wine, you would serve people wine over a multiple day party and whatever was left over became like your diary. That was like what you went off to set up your house with. And so to get to a wedding and to have the wedding run out of wine was basically say, I'm bankrupt. We don't have bucks. We've got nothing. We're empty. Um, and for that to happen also means that the couple getting married, they're going into their marriage. They haven't even survived day one. They're already broke. And so this is the context. And then, um, now there were six stone jars there for the Jewish rite of purification. This is at the wedding. Each holding 20 or 30 gallons. Jesus said to the servants, fill the jars with water. And they filled them up to the brim. And he said to them, now draw out some and take it to the master of the feast. So they took it. And the master of the feast tasted the wine, tasted the water, now become wine, and did not know where it came from, though the servants who had drawn the water knew. The master of the feast called the bridegroom and said, Everyone serves the good wine first. When people have drunk freely, then the poor wine. You have kept the good wine until now. This was the first sign of Jesus. And so the picture we have is not that we have a good bottle of wine with Jesus. I'm going to that corner. Please mute me. Me back on. The picture we have is that we bring a glass of water. Sit down for a good meal. And there we have it. Jesus, my glass of water, my crusty old bread, this is my meal. So Jesus presents us with that picture, and we, in the New Testament, if we read it carefully, we present him with our bankruptcy, with our relational bankruptcy, with our emptiness, with our embarrassment. We present him with um, stale old bread, our hunger, we present him with all of these things. And the beautiful part about Jesus is that he doesn't throw the water away, he doesn't throw the bread away, he works miracles with that. See, I started with the story of my brother saying, how do you lose weight? Well, you eat a little less. See, if you want to get fit or physically in shape, the exact amount that you put in is what you're going to get out. So if you don't exercise, you eat badly, you eat a lot, you're not going to be in shape. That's how it works. If you do the opposite and you do it to the excess, you'll be on the cover of men's health. Um, see, Jesus doesn't work like that. When we talk about training in godliness, he's not saying, you better have the best bread. You better have the best wine. You better have everything ready every morning. Read your Bible 10 times this year, backwards once in Greek. He says, what do you have? And some mornings, if I'm honest, I have water and bread. That's what I have. I don't have much else. But actually, God's okay with that. Jesus is fine with that. He says to his disciples, actually, do this in remembrance of me. So I would encourage you this year, irrespective of where you feel you are in the year, at any point in the year, you feel like, mm, it's, not gonna, it's, not doing, it's not going where I thought it's going to go. Right now, this is what I can give to Jesus. Can I encourage you? Give it. Step forward and give it, and you'll see what he can do. There's a verse in Psalms that says, um, 
just as the servant looks to the hand of the master and the maiden looks to the hand of her, mis- hand of her, her mistress, so we look for the mercies of God. I'm paraphrasing there. I think it's Psalm 132. Um, and sometimes at 3CR, what I do is I look to the hand of the master. What is he busy with? What can I see? And what I've seen in this church in the last year, I've seen an old Afrikaans Umi baptize a black person. I've seen a black person baptize a white person. I've seen rich and poor in that baptismal pool. I've seen standing up here at the end of last year, a couple that were divorced. Everything except the ink on the paper, done. And I've seen a marriage be restored. So I look to the hand of the master and I see what he's busy with. And I'll say, in this church, we, we want miracles like that. There's no ways broken marriages like that are just restored. It doesn't just happen. You don't get unity from people from completely different backgrounds and walks unless God is working in people's lives. It doesn't happen. Unity is found at the foot of the cross. And so where people get to the foot of the cross, then they find it. Uh, And we desire that more. We desire the miraculous. We desire for 4,000 people to be saved, to be um, fed. We, We desire for wine to be poured out in this place, gallons of wine, his spirit. But where it starts is not there. It starts here for me. It starts with what I have. And so for me, uh, they say you shouldn't share your New Year's resolution because you're statistically less likely to achieve it if you do. But actually, training in godliness is not an achievement. It's just a recognition that you're going to keep bringing what you do have. That line from, um, from the disciples when they say, how can we feed these people bread in this desolate place? And he asked them, what do you have? It's not because God needs what we have. It's just asking for us to add the little bit to the miracle he is working. And sometimes that miracle is just quiet time after quiet time every morning where no one sees, just praying into something again and again when it feels like it's going nowhere. And those are the miracles that we've seen in this place. We've seen... Um, a lady in this church for years and years have a prayer meeting at a school in this city. Um, her sons eventually left the school. Prayer meeting ended and we've seen revival break out of that school. We don't know the end of where that glass of water or where that crusty piece of, piece of bread goes. But would I encourage you that every morning or whenever you do, put those things in front of Jesus. Take them to him. He doesn't actually need the water and the bread. Um, But actually, we don't believe in getting out what you put in. This is not a gym routine. This is spiritual godliness. We believe that Jesus puts in everything, and we bring what we have. 